Hello and welcome to the UC Davis Energy Exchange webinar series. Today's webinar topic is Ensure Effective Water Delivery and Optimize Energy Use, Enabling Data-Driven Choices with Smart Software. Our speakers for today are Lindsay Stubick, Water Efficiency Manager at Moulton Nigel Water District, and Aaron Musabadesu, Graduate Student Researcher at the, UC, at the UC Davis Center for Water Energy Efficiency. My name is Paul Fortunato, the Creative Specialist for the Energy and Efficiency Institute, and your host of today's webinar. The research presented today would not be possible without the generous contributions from our sponsor, the California Energy Commission. Thank you for supporting our energy efficiency research. Now, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Everyone who has joined the webinar is currently muted and is in listen-only mode. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your control panel. I'll bring them up during the presentation, and we will also have 15 minutes for questions at the end. I will also provide a contact slide at the end of this webinar so that you may quickly get in touch with us. This webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to each of you. These webinars are a service provided by the collaborative efforts of the Energy and Efficiency Institute, Western Cooling Efficiency Center, California Lighting Technology Center, and the Center for Water Energy Efficiency. These webinars would not be possible without the continued support of all of our affiliate partners. We want to thank you for supporting these efforts. We encourage you to stay in touch by joining our mailing list and following us on Twitter and YouTube. We do publish a monthly newsletter, and these newsletters offer a, cur a current glimpse into the research events and notable happenings at each of the UC Davis Energy Research Centers. If you've not yet signed up for our newsletter, you can follow the link on the screen or send me a message with your email address in the question box, and I will get you registered. Today's topic, once again, is ensure effective water delivery and optimize energy use. Enabling Data-Driven Choices with Smart Software. And now let's welcome Aaron Musugadesu. Aaron, I'm gonna pass this to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, as Paul mentioned a couple times, my name is Erin Musubendesu, and I'm a graduate student researcher for the Center for Water, G at Water Energy Efficiency. Um, today's webinar is focusing on enabling data-driven choices with smart software at water distribution utilities in order to ensure effective water delivery and optimize energy use. So today we're going to be looking at how California, California's energy sector has changed in recent years and discuss how those changes have led to an increasing need for customer energy demand management. Um, we will also be looking at how water utilities can manage their energy load in order to better uh, participate in increasingly dynamic energy markets. And finally, we're gonna give an overview of a tool that we are developing here at SWE that will help water utilities participate in those um, dynamic markets and perform energy demand management, which is called the energy demand management system. So before we dive in, let's take a quick poll to start out as an icebreaker and a fun way to connect everyone to the content that we're going to be discussing today. So Paul, if you could um, enable that poll, thank you. So the first question we have is, do you currently consider the time of day when you make decisions about using energy at home? Um, and you can select one of the following choices, never, sometimes, and always. And we'll give you a few minutes to respond to that poll. Okay, great. Um, and then we're going to open up another quick poll question. So it's the same question, but um, this time focusing on making decisions about energy at work. And we'll give you a few minutes to respond to that poll as well. Thank you. 
and then shortly we'll present our results. And for those of you joining the call at this time, thank you again for joining us. Okay, so uh, you can see that there's some interesting results here. 24% uh, of you said never think about it when you're at home and sometimes uh, for 60%, which is the largest group of people, and then always uh, for 16%. Sorry, I said 60. When I, um, so actually that's like a significant amount of people who are sometimes considering uh, but time when they're making their decisions for energy at home. Let's take a look at the second poll. Okay, so most people on the call are not thinking about the decisions of using, when they're using energy at work, um, with a few people considering it and very few people always considering it. So as you can kind of see from this, people are beginning to start to think of when they are using energy. Um, and part of what we're gonna be talking about today is why the time of energy use matters now more than ever. As many of you know, California has pursued a policy of increasing the number of renewable generation sources uh, in order to reduce greenhouse gases on the electricity grid. Um, much of what has been integrated has been solar. Um, and because solar is intermittent and non-dispatchable, this has led to some operational challenges. Now, non-dispatchable means that you can't turn it on at will. The figure to the right is illustrating what's happening on the grid right now. If you look at the purple line, this is the net energy demand that is put on the grid by customers, how much energy that the uh, customers need delivered in megawatts. The yellow line and the green line are solar and wind generation in megawatts respectively as shown on the right axis. And the blue line is the uh, net energy load which is the total demand minus these intermittent renewable resources. Now this blue line is what needs to be supplied by dispatchable generation sources, such as natural gas, power plants, or hydropower, things that can actually be controlled or turned on at will. And this is where most of the operational challenges uh, incur. So many of you may recognize this figure. Um, this is what is known as the duck curve, and it shows how the net load that we talked about in the previous slide is changing over time. As you can see, as renewable integration increases, particularly solar, um, the belly of this duck is in increasing in depth. And you can also see that the ramp in the evening in order to provide uh, peak energy demand is becoming increasingly steep and large. And this, is, this needs to be met by dispatchable resources and so that is becoming a more and more challenging effort. The second issue that's occurring is that there's a potential for overgeneration. Because solar is variable in nature, when it's coming onto the grid, it's sometimes difficult to know at what intensity that it will come on. And so this can cause some um, overgeneration issues in the system. The energy sector is looking at a lot of different solutions to this problem because we want to continue to increase renewable integration and reduce the GHG intensity of our grid. And one of the um, solutions to this is energy demand side management. And that's what we're gonna be really focusing on today. So what is energy demand side management? 
that's when customers manage their energy use in different ways. And for California, that means shifting energy out of the peak time period in the evening and potentially shifting energy into the middle of the day when renewable resources are most readily available. There's a couple benefits with shifting energy into this time. Uh, it also allows for your personal use to be less GHG intense, and also it allows for the entire grid to integrate more renewable energy. So today we're gonna to be talking about two ways that you can manage your energy load. Um, the first one we're talking about is energy load shaping. So energy load shaping is long-term behavior change. So this is something that would happen seasonally. You would uh, change your, your energy load out of one time period and into another, but this would be a similar energy load from a day-to-day -day perspective. An example of an energy market incentive that promotes this is static time of use energy rates. The second way is through energy load shifting. Now energy load shifting is a more immediate response to market requests. Um, unlike load shaping, which is the same incentive day to day for a particular season, market incentives for load shifting will change day to day or minute to minute. Several energy market incentive programs that help promote this are energy demand response or dynamic energy pricing. So let's talk a little bit more about these market mechanisms and how they work. The figure on the left is showing static time of use energy rate structures. As you can see, uh, the prices are varying during different times of the day. Often IOUs will have specific time of rates that will promote different use during different seasons. And so this is something that, like we mentioned, is static and known, um, but is timing the time variant energy rate. The second rate structure that we're looking at is dynamic energy rate structures or markets. An example of this would be the KISO wholesale market. As you can see from this figure here, it is showing prices that are for megawatt hours. And this is the red line is the average price and blue light dots are the prices that are varying day to day. So as you can see, this price structure is varying fairly significantly from hour to hour or day to day. Unlike the static one, which is static over a specific season. The third one we're looking at is energy demand response programs. So this figure here is showing how an energy demand response program would work. The shaded area is a window that a utility would ask you to reduce your load in. And the blue line is showing a load that is fairly static for the other hours and then reduced during that window and then goes back to its normal load after the demand response event has completed. A couple of examples for this in the California market are the proxy demand resource program and there are many IOU specific DR programs that can be accessed. So this provides a lot of opportunities for water utilities. Water utilities are fairly large energy users um, and they have some flexibility to change their operations by changing when different pumps are operating. Additionally, if water utilities have excess water storage, they can further shift their operations pumping to an elevated tank during one time and then letting the system be gravity fed where possible at another time. This research into 
optimizing energy load shifting is an expansion on previous research in the energy cost water quality sector for pump operation optimization schemes. However, the complexity of water distribution systems makes energy demand management a very difficult task. There are a lot of things that you have to take account of, including water quality, minimum system pressures, hydraulic limitations, and operational limitations. So in order to help water utilities overcome some of these challenges and begin to participate in more dynamic energy market schemes and perform energy demand management, SWE has begun development on a decision support tool that will enable data-driven decisions. And that's what we're gonna be talking about for the remainder of this webinar. So what is an EDMS, as we have dubbed this? Um, it is a water utility management and optimization software. It forecasts hydraulic simulations to evaluate a variety of water network operation scenarios, and it's recommending or testing the necessary operating controls to help operators make daily decisions based on user-defined objectives. In essence, it's providing optimized rule-based controls and real-time real forecasts for the operator based on those control schemes. So how is this different from previous decision support tools that help water utilities optimize their operations for energy management? Well, one of the ways that is significantly different is that previous support tools are utilizing and optimizing pump schedules. Um, many of the softwares that are doing this are GEMS Darwin Designer, InfoWater's Scheduler, Dracetto's Aquadept, and they've all focused on optimizing what is dubbed a pump schedule. A pump schedule is shown here in this figure Basically, it's a daily schedule of when a pump turns on and off, typically given in hourly blocks. Unfortunately, these schedules are often unreliable because they're based on forecasted demands that may change and on situations that may change. And in order to maintain the reliability of using these schedules, they have to be generated very regularly, sometimes as often as 15 minutes. This can be very burdensome for operators and it makes it difficult for the operator to predict how the system will react to these changes since the changes themselves are changing frequently. These schedules often aren't being implemented in practice because they're not typically or naturally how operators are managing their systems. So how are they operating their systems? They're typically managed using rule-based controls that are implemented in SCADA and then overseen by operators and then day-to-day -day decisions are made on top of that. The effects of these rule-based controls can be easily interpreted by operators and they are very resilient to varying water customer demands. The EDMS is focusing on optimizing these rule-based controls rather than fully relying on pump schedules. An example of a rule-based control would be to turn a pump on if a tank level is less than 10 feet, or to turn that same pump off if a tank level is greater than 25 feet, or the time is between 4 and 8 p.m. There are several things that are being incorporated into the EDMS in order to provide recommendations. The first thing is real-time and historical SCADA data. So this is integrated into a SCADA system. The second thing that will be inputted into the EDMS is a hydraulic model. Um, for, for this software, we are using EPA NAP models. This is an open source modeling software, and most commercial softwares can export their hydraulic models into the EPA NAP format. So it allows for the most users who have hydraulic software to be able to utilize this as well. 
the EDMS is also incorporating energy rate program participation data in order to make these recommendations. In order to use an EDMS, there are some minimum requirements for, for the water utility. First of all, you need a quality EPA net hydraulic model. It must be built as an extended period simulation. It has to run without crashing for long periods of time, and it can be must be calibrated to ensure the results are accurate and reliable. Another thing that will help with the system flexibility is excess water storage. And this will allow water utilities to participate in more dynamic energy markets rather than just participating in load shaping because they will have additional energy flexibility. Let's dive a little bit deeper in how the EDMS works. So the first thing that you would do once you have integrated the SCADA and the EPA net model is to build a base scenario. And this base scenario would simulate how the water utility currently oper operates. Once you've built the base scenario, then you can create an optimized scenario. And you can optimize this scenario for any set of objectives or combination of objectives that the user selects. The third option is for an operator to design either an alteration of the base or the optimized scenarios or create an entirely new rule set that they would like to test using the EDMS. So this is really meant to be a decision support tool, allowing water utility operators the most flexibility in what they are going to do and how they can achieve that. Once the scenarios have been built, the EDMS can be used to compare scenarios. So for each given scenario, the EDMS is providing a full hydraulic simulation for a given time period, including tank levels, system pressures, and flows. It's also providing operating policies and the energy, energy cost, and estimated GHGs for that scenario over that time period. Once they've compared it, the operators can select a scenario to operate to. And then you can move into real-time analysis. So once the selected scenario is chosen, the EDMS will provide a week ahead forecast of the full hydraulic model and operation policies and controls to implement based on this scenario that the operator selected to operate to in order to achieve whichever objective they want, including various energy market schemes or programs. What we have here is a preliminary mock-up of the type of information that the EDMS would provide to the user during real-time analysis. So on the left here, we have what we're currently calling SCADA Plus, which is giving you a snapshot in time very similar to a normal SCADA system uh, with a few extra pieces of information such as pump efficiency or total energy load at the time. On the lower left side, you can see that this is reminding the pump rules uh, based on the scenario that is chosen. On the lower right hand side, there are two graphs showing the forecasts based on the scenario, and you can toggle between different assets within the water distribution system to see how they will be performing according to that forecast. And then at the top, there's some monthly statistics of what is happening in terms of energy used, peak load, and also it shows the savings compared to the baseline scenario for energy cost and GHG emissions. So now I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay Stuvik from Molten Nagel. We are partnering with her on this CEC project that has enabled us to develop this software, and we will be piloting the software um, at Molten Nagel later in the upcoming years. 
Great. Well, thank you, Erin. Um, so my name is Lindsay Stubick. I manage the water efficiency department over at Moulton Miguel Water District. And we're really excited about our partnership with UC Davis and very happy to be on the webinar today to share our experience so far. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer those or put you in touch with um, someone at our department or someone at our facility who can answer those. So without further ado, I will jump into the project. Oops. Erin, would you mind advancing the slide? I couldn't get it to advance. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so a little bit about Moulton Miguel. We provide water, recycled water, and wastewater services for about 172,000 people in South Orange County. We serve six cities, uh, Laguna Niguel, Laguna Hills, Aliso Viejo, Mission Viejo, and parts of Dana Point and San Juan Capistrano. And if you're not familiar with uh, South Orange County or our location, we're about halfway between Los Angeles and San Diego. Um, we have 55,000 accounts, 85% of which are residential. We really are a, a bedroom community. Um, we have a seven-member board and 158 employees. We also have a water budget-based uh, rate structure, which makes us a little different than some other agencies. We are AAA rated by Fitch and Standard & Poor. And we like to consider ourselves a data-driven utility. Uh, we are one of the founding members of the California Data Collaborative, and we're one of the first agencies to actually keep data scientists on staff. We actually got our very first data science intern back in 2014, and since then we've built up a staff with a couple of data scientists that help us do anything from internal analytics to developing uh, data visualization tools for customers and they also helped us win, uh, actually we were the only district, water district in the world to be recognized by Amazon for cloud innovation for using their Redshift database. Um, okay, next please. Thank you. Okay, so a little bit about our energy efficiency project. So as Aaron mentioned, we partnered with UC Davis and the Water and Energy Efficiency Center um, back in about 2015, and we got a $3 million grant from the California Energy Commission. And the goal of which was really to explore what the opportunities were for demand response in the water sector and to try to take advantage of these time of use rates. Um, you know, our goal personally is to evaluate whether Molten can participate in the wholesale grid uh, load shifting scheme or maybe some other our local retailer scheme to obtain incentives to shift our energy use. It's probably a good time to mention but the district actually has two uh, local energy providers. So our SoCal Edison actually serves the northern and western part of our service area, and we're pretty much split in half, and the bottom or southern or eastern portion is serviced by San Diego Gas and Electric. Um, so I feel like we presented one of the most interesting <laughs> kind of scenarios to UC Davis, so it's, good, it's a good opportunity to look at the wholesale grid, as well as two other um, IOU operational schemes to see if we can fit into those uh, load shifting programs. And then um, basically the goal be to develop and implement the EDMS model, and that will be informed by our SCADA data, as well as our pumping and energy sensors to see if we can help optimize energy use in our operations, but also to forecast energy and cost savings. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me just give you a little bit more information about the district and our service area. This will provide a little more context uh, for our project. We operate just under 700 miles of potable mains and about 150 miles of recycled water mains. I like to say that we are topographically gifted in that uh, we're a very hilly area, but we like to take advantage of that topography to operate several storage reservoirs. Uh, we meet approximately 75% of our total water demand with potable water, and within that system, we have 28 operational storage reservoirs and 22 pump stations that move water to higher pressure zones. 
And then the remaining 25% of our total water demand, we meet with recycled water. And within that system, we have 11 storage reservoirs and we operate another 10 pump stations. And so as I mentioned, the district largely spans several bedroom communities in South Orange County, 80 to 85% residential. We have some commercial accounts, but almost no industrial accounts. However, we do have just in our small service area, just over 400 HOAs. And so we do serve a number of dedicated irrigation meters. Um, and then uh, looking at the images that you see here <clears throat> on the screen, I don't think this exactly matches our demand profile, but it's pretty close, uh, where the majority of our water is actually consumed in the late evenings and early mornings for irrigation purposes. And consumption drops around mid to late day and then stays pretty low throughout the afternoon and early evening until people come home and then their automatic timers kick on later in the, uh, the evenings and early mornings. And so since we are pretty hilly and pump driven, our energy demand tends to correspond pretty tightly with our water demand. Um, which is pretty much the opposite of when the cleanest, most abundant energy is available on the grid. But I think that's what makes this project so exciting is that we actually get a chance to participate in it and see if we can use this EDMS software to help us modify our pumping and our storage operations and take advantage of these time of use rates and even get a chance to explore the different time of use rate schemes um, so that we can lower our energy costs and reduce the greenhouse gas intensity um, of our operations. Thanks, Aaron. So as a water efficiency manager, getting to participate in this project, oh, could you go back one more on the project objectives? Thank you, sorry. <laughs> so the water efficiency manager getting to participate in this program, um, I thought it was really cool because I usually don't get to do a lot of the operational schemes, uh, but I do participate in a lot of our water loss programming. So we're basically using the same team that we've established over the last five or six years and doing water loss. Um, Part of our project objectives, although a little out of scope, but I really was excited about it, was we got to quantify our energy intensity of our potable water and recycled water system. And for a water efficiency manager, knowing that energy intensity of different pressure zones within your service area, if I know I can take out 100 toilets here and save a certain amount of kilowatt hours and a certain amount of greenhouse gases, you know, I can use that for further revenue generating opportunities like getting grants or even possibly opting into um, like the greenhouse gas market for like from CARB funding. So those are just things that I was super excited about um, in participating in this program. Uh, but also, you know, we get the, the chance to explore operational changes and get a chance to manage our loads differently and optimize our operations. You know, so um, it's been great working with UC Davis, coming up with ways to potentially ramp up and shift our energy use at different times to take advantage of time, time of use rates, um, see if we can respond differently. You know, and to work with our operators who their their main goal is to make sure that water quality still stays paramount and that we still maintain a safe water system and then finding ways to calibrate this model to see if we can achieve all of those things. Um, and then again, reducing our greenhouse gases, or at least if we can't reduce the energy and like the energy use that we have, at least reducing the greenhouse gas intensity of each unit of energy by shifting those time of use or shifting our time of use to um, earlier hours or during that, that midday period. Okay, next one. Thank you. Okay, so our project status, we've been working with UC Davis now for about a couple of years, maybe two and a half years. Um, we've completed our energy intensity analyses, so we have all of that information for our potable and recycled water systems down to the pressure zone. Uh, we are now in the process of refining our potable hydraulic model, which once we get that completed, we can get started on building the EDMS on top of it. Um, we're installing energy meters at our active pumping stations all over the district. So the image that you see to the right is kind of an outlined image of, of our service area denoted by our meter locations. And those P symbols show where our active pumping stations are um, on the potable system. And so we'll be uh, to transmit all that sensor information that we're installing at those different pumping stations. We're actually utilizing our existing communication infrastructure. So about three or four years ago, the district decided that we wanted to do full AMI in our service area within a seven year time period. So we installed a seven tower collection network all over the service area that um, pretty much can serve most of South Orange County. And I'm glad we'd had the foresight to do that because we can just plug right into that network and 
uh, plug these energy sensors in, and that'll also feed into the EDMS model that UC Davis is developing for us. Okay, next one. Um, so our next steps are to complete our energy sensor installation. We've got about half of them done. Uh, I believe overall we're going to install anywhere between 40 to 60 sensors. Um, we need to implement the EDMS software and just get it configured to the district system. Um, and then I think this is going to be key, develop an operational guideline for our EDMS technology. Really, a lot of this comes down to whether the operators understand and trust uh, the system and how well they'll be able to, to use it and then just get a feel for it. Uh, so really, they'll just need to gain some familiarity with the, with the EDMS and the IOU bidding system. Uh, depending on which scheme we choose, um, we'll have to become familiar with that as well. And then implement. You know, The goal would be to run the pilot for 12 months, uh, gain feedback, and probably iterate as we go along. But we're super excited to see how it will turn out. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, yeah, so we're really excited to be working with Molten Nagel on this project um, and to be developing this software and have the ability to actually pilot, work with operators, um, people in the field, and see how this system really works and try and really tailor it to um, be as useful uh, and as formative as possible. So as part of that, um, we are also trying to develop uh, long-term user support as we develop more users. So we're partnering with the California Water Efficiency Partnership, which is an organization that works with water utilities all over California, and to develop and build, maintain, and support an EDMS user group. So as part of this project, we are looking for actively utilities interested in joining this EDMS user group uh, who would be interested in testing out the software and piloting it with their different systems. In addition, we're also partnering with Southern California Edison uh, to look at water utility specific energy rates and looking at utilities who would be interested in piloting both the EDMS and energy specific utility rates. So if you have any interest in participating in that way, please let me know. And now we will start uh, answering questions. Great. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Lindsay. Um, it looks like we do have uh, a question um, from Warren. Um, his question is, what do you mean by excess storage? So excess storage, um, in the case of Molten Nagel, means that their uh, storage systems are oversized um, for reliability, and so they have additional storage that can be used in a flexible manner. Um, this can look different for different water utilities, um, but it just means that the storage isn't critical to providing your customers with water, but that you can actually change your operations and store at different times. And like I had mentioned previously, this type of storage is not necessary for certain types of flexibility, but it definitely the more storage or redundancy you have in your system, then the more ability you would have to have that pump operation flexibility. Thank you so much for your question. Great. Um, so questions are open. Uh, we'll give you guys a few minutes to, uh, to think of your questions. Um, and while you're thinking of that, I have a few of my own here, um, uh, Aaron or Lindsay. Uh, what are the challenges that water distribution systems face when energy load shifting, particularly in a dynamic energy market? Um, I can start off and then Lindsay, maybe you can add some things. Sure. 
Um, I think knowing how flexible your system is, is a part of that key challenge. And then understanding how changing your operations is going to impact different things like water quality, um, making sure that your system pressures are still maintained. Um, and also, as Lindsay kind of mentioned in her presentation, some of these energy rate programs are fairly complex. And so there, there needs to be some sort of education or connection on how these programs work and how water utilities can participate in them. Yeah, and I, I think I would just echo what you mentioned, Erin, is that, um, you know, a lot of uh, you know, our operators have a certain way that they've operated for many years. And you know they they trust their current system of operation, and so um, it's great to have the type of technology that you're developing, um, you know, to help them gain some comfort and familiarity with like a new type of system and build some trust in it, because you know their goal is to maintain a high high level of water quality, um, and then also like you said, exposing them to like the different types of bidding systems, whether it's the a proxy demand response system or like a, a retailer's scheme. Um, so that way they get familiar with it and they can learn like where, where those little margins are that they can start to exploit, like where they know they're comfortable with operating their system and what the tool is suggesting that they do. So I think that's why um, we decided to do the 12-month pilot so it would give them plenty of time to become comfortable with, with both of those types of systems. Okay, great. Um, we have another question here from Travis. Please explain how forecasting will be used within the EDMS approach. Could forecasting of near-term water demand based on recent use history and weather forecasts help quantify the energy and cost savings which are attainable? Yeah, so um, I, th I think I understand your question here. So we are using um, water demand. So EPA Net is a demand-driven hydraulic modeling software, meaning you'd need demands in order to determine how it's going to impact the system, how water is going to flow within the system. And so um, water demands and forecasting water demands is a key component of the EDMS software. And getting those accurate water demand forecasts is important. Um, and so that's part of what it's being built on, as well as having an accurate hydraulic model so that the different pressures are actually what's reflected in the real system. Um, so those are kind of the two key components. And we will be using um, water demand forecasting that is reliant on things such as temperature and participation or precipitation um, in order to build those forecasts. So I hope that answers that question. Okay, uh, we have another one here from David. Um, can you provide any findings, guidance on energy intensity, a kilowatt hour per thousand gallons or CO2E per thousand gallons? Yeah, so that is uh, part of, and Lindsay spoke of this and I, it wasn't included in the mock-up, but that is something that we are wanting to include in the EDMS as part of the results summary is the energy intensity that is occurring within the system um, and the GHG intensity uh, so that water operators can have that knowledge and uh, water utilities management systems can have that information as well. So Aaron, do we have some numbers or some ballparks as it sounds like he wants to oh, have, have an idea uh, yeah we we don't have those ballpark numbers yet uh, this system is meant to be used on lots of different water utilities and so mm -hmm. um it would be different for, for each utility. water utility yeah okay. yeah even within the water utility if i can add i know when we did our intensity study we actually found that the energy intensity was actually higher in our recycled water system than our potable water system so Okay, great. Um, so uh, David Rivers has a, not a question, but a, more of just a statement he wanted to add. Um, as advancing technology becomes available, education will be critical for operators in making future enhancements to how they have, uh, have been operating their systems. Um, just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of his statement. Um, we do have another question from Warren. Uh, different utilities may have several water sources to deliver groundwater, imported water, et cetera. Is this factored into the EDMS? Yes, yes. Yeah. So 
that's factored in through the hydraulic model. Um, and so that model would simulate all of those different water sources and where they're coming in and at what times they are coming in. And that may require, um, the, the EDMS is built to sort of predict what the wa water operator would do based on what they've previously done, but it's also um, a requirement that the operators interact with it and say, whether what they are planning on doing in terms of water purchases or water source management. Let's see here. Looks like there's um, somebody through a chat in here. Okay, question from Claire. Um, can the EDMS be modeled to predict optimizing the water pumps with research by previous UCD researchers? who shared replacing pumps with energy creating pumps. Yeah, um, that is something that we're looking at in the future to um, potentially incorporate actually um, pumps as turbines or different energy recovery systems uh, in order to also add that into the system and add that into the ener overall energy optimization. But that's not something that we're exploring in this particular pilot, but definitely something we're interested in exploring in the future. Great. Uh, Travis has another question. Uh, what are the mechanisms for verifying that the demand forecast from EPA net reflects reality? How quickly can the optimization be rerun if there is a significant divergence between demand forecast and the actual demand? So because um, these, so the optimization is built on historical information. And so it's resilient to a lot of different water demands. And because it's a rule set, it's also resilient to different water customer demands to respond to those um, and maintain reliability. So that, that's how the optimization is built. And then in terms of um, when it's in the real-time analysis, as customer demands are changing, that will be recorded in the SCADA and the forecasts will be updated um, through that knowledge, through the knowledge of how they are changing. Um, so, so they will be able to quickly update that just because of the way that it's set up with the rules rather than pump schedules. Um, I hope that's clear. Okay. I have one more question for you, for you two. Um, what factors contribute to the financial profitability of energy load shifting at a water distribution system? Lindsay, I think this should be for you. Um, so, I can start this and maybe Lindsay can also add in too. Um, I think it really depends on how much flexibility they have in the system, which we kind of talked about before, and that can be sort of influenced by the storage they have. And then also, um, if they're larger energy users, then they have more energy to play with and that can be more profitable as well. And then I think additionally, um, there's this kind of user importance as well. So uh, the operators being comfortable with shifting energy loads and really knowing and being able to make decisions that are not going to impact the quality and reliability of their water service. Yeah, and I'll, again, I'll echo Aaron. I think that those are, those are exactly the key things that, that we'll need to look at. What kind of flexibility do we have you know, what are the operators comfortable with? I mean, get them to try a couple of different things and just, again, build confidence in the tools that they're using that have been designed specifically for their system. Great. Um, any more questions um, from the attendees? Okay, I think Travis has another one here. Uh, if, e let's see. if EDMS becomes widely adopted, how could decisions from various EDMSs be aggregated across the territories of multiple utilities? <laughs> this is uh, when I wish that we could ask the participants to also chime in, because uh, I know we have Dave Rivers from SCE here. Um, but yeah, so I think that depending on the size of the load 
um, because water utilities have significant energy load, they can potentially be able to serve um, energy needs with just the their energy load and managing that. Um, but I think there is some potential to also aggregate those loads, especially for smaller utilities. And I think that there will need to be some rise in the market of uh, these type of private companies that are willing to aggregate these loads and uh, that, that they have done in similar um, markets such as agricultural pumping uh, in order to participate in these kind of programs. Great. Um, Danielle has a question. Um, given the large role that operators will play in the success of implementing EDMSs, what sort of collaboration have you directly had with operators to incorporate their feedback at this stage? Can you share some of that feedback? Sure. Um, so we're fairly early in the development of it, um, but we have been working hand in hand with Molten Nagel um, closely. Mm -hmm. We've had several meetings going down and talking directly to their operators. Also, SWE helped build the potable hydraulic model for Molten Nagel. And so I think we were able to build some trust um, through that process just being able to see how their system operates and show that we understand how their system is operating. Um, and so through that kind of goodwill, we've also spoken to them about the um, the interface slightly, um, and we're planning on continuing that interaction with them. Um, shortly, we'll be going down them to give a draft uh, user interface and incorporate their feedback that way. We're also looking at um, talking to various other water utility operators in order to get a varied set of feedbacks. I know that every water distribution system operator handles things in a slightly different way, and so we want it to be able to be functional for as large a base of users as possible. Okay. Great. Uh, David Rivers wanted to just say, I think he's on his cell phone, so it's difficult. Uh, he says, too much to type on my cell phone. Uh, to the previous <laughs> question, aggregation has multiple benefits for both water and energy grids. Wonderful. Thank you so much for weighing in. <laughs> Just give it one more minute to see if anyone else has any more questions. Um, Kendra also wanted to, to mention, um, Aaron, you probably know this, but she just wanted to make sure others know, uh, we're also working with operators at ABM, ABMUD. East Bay Mud. Yes, yes, we are also working with operators at East Bay Mud to get their feedback. And um, in addition to that, we've uh, gathered a group of technical advisory uh, members uh, in order to get the feedback from lots of different people um, in different sectors uh, on this technology and um, making sure that it's as functional as possible. Great. Well, I think that just about does it. Thanks everyone for participating today. Um, after this webinar, there will be a short survey that will appear. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it if you would uh, take a minute to complete it. Uh, it would help us um, make sure that we're delivering the type of content uh, that is relevant to you.
Um, we will also be sending out a copy of this presentation shortly. Again, I want to thank you all for joining us today, and we'll see you again next time.